I'm excited to be here. It's been incredible to hear from so many who are in the audience. And I'm excited to tell you the story about Triage Go and to share with you how our team is working to transform emergency care delivery using artificial intelligence. And in particular, how we're doing it by starting at the very first decision that is made on a patient's journey in the hospital-based care system, uh, emergency department triage. Uh, so I have a few disclosures. Um, I'm currently uh, working as medical director for research and innovation uh, at Beckman Coulter uh, in a clinical decision support uh, business unit that, that we formed recently. I'm gonna talk a little more about these relationships in an upcoming slide. I was previously chief medical officer for a uh, Johns Hopkins startup company called Stochastic. Uh, that's how I, I came to Beckman Coulter. I'm one of the inventors of Triage Go. I should say that the true inventor is in the audience, uh, Scott Levin, uh, sitting back here, uh, who should really get the credit. Uh, and I have research funding related to this from numerous federal agencies and, and continue to do federally funded research at Johns Hopkins. So I'm gonna start with this slide. Uh, and I'm gonna explain kind of our relationship and how we came to be a part of the Danaher family. But first, I'd like to, I'm, I'm gonna call on you guys to help me a little bit later in this lecture and I'll ask you to participate. So if you'll reach down on the right side of your chair, many of you have a little purple post-it. It's posted on the beam to the right of your chair, okay? If you have one of those purple post-its, I'm gonna ask you to take it and just sit it on the desk in front of you, okay? So, <clears throat> The reason I'm including this slide is because it kind of encapsulates what we're here talking about today, right? How do we as academics, as people who form startups, as industry partner together for innovation? So the tool that I'm gonna tell you about Triage Go started as a research project back in 2015. Uh, it, it, was initially just a paper, it then became a grant funded uh, research project by AHRQ. Uh, it led to a publication in Annals of Emergency Medicine that remains one of the most cited uh, publications in that journal. It was the first machine learning tool in emergency medicine, definitely uh, one of the first to be implemented in clinical care anywhere. Um, we got uh, funding from the National Science Foundation to, to create a startup company to try to disseminate research tools like this through commercial pathways. Uh, and then we started doing more and more research in this space, and we started collaborating with industry, and very importantly, collaborating with Danaher and with Beckman Coulter. Uh, we didn't plan to join the team, right? But we, do, we started us doing uh, research, uh, and we found that our, our motivations were aligned. We were all trying to take care of patients, so we wanted to do it in a similar way. And then in 2022, our small startup was acquired by uh, Beckman Coulter, and that's how we became a part of the Danaher family. And we continue to collaborate with Johns Hopkins and with other universities doing federally funded research, and our goal is really to improve patient care. So I think a success story of, of how we can collaborate together. So we're talking about emergency department care here. Who in the audience has been to an emergency department in the past 18 months, either by yourself or with someone you care about? Just raise your hand high, okay? There's a lot of hands. That's not surprising, because in the United States, Every year there are 140 million emergency department visits, right? That's a lot. That translates to one emergency department visit for about every 2.4 Americans. That's astounding. And that happens every single year. Um, these emergency departments, I'm guessing that your experience was not incredibly pleasant. Nobody wants to go, but even when you get there, it's not a great place to be. They're really, really crowded. This, uh, image on the left here is a report from the Institute of Medicine from 2007, uh, basically saying our emergency care system is broken, it's overwhelmed, if we don't fix it, it's going to implode and, and our health system's gonna fall apart. Things have gotten much worse since 2007, not better. Uh, the number of visits has gone up by about 30% uh, every year. Uh, we heard about uh, rural hospitals closing, so less emergency departments to take care of them in. And especially after the pandemic, our uh, healthcare staff are burned out, uh, and there is a ton of attrition. So we have major shortages in staffing in the emergency department. Uh, at least some of the time, 90% of emergency departments in the United States are stressed beyond the breaking point. Uh, and then for many of those, every single day, they're stressed to that point. So uh, a few of my colleagues are in the room. We practice in an emergency department, Johns Hopkins, up the road about an hour. Uh, it is not uncommon at all for us to have more than two times the number of people in our ED as we have beds to take care of them. So look around and imagine this is an ED, right? You're all sick, you're waiting for care, and you're all competing with one other person in here to get to that bed all the time. That's the volume that we're dealing with every day. Um, it's not surprising that this is associated with a lot of harms. So harms for the patient. So what happens when we have this kind of crowding? Safety suffers, quality of care suffers, the experience suffers. For hospitals and healthcare systems, there's reputational damage, regulatory damage. Imagine being a stroke center and you're missing strokes in the waiting room. This kind of stuff happens because you can't get to the patient. 
right? Uh, and then for everyone, there are major financial harms uh, for the individual, for the healthcare system, and then for our society as a whole. We're losing a lot of money because our, our hospital-based uh, emergency care systems are really inefficient. So what do we do when demand for care outstrips supply, as it does in American healthcare? Well, we triage. This is a concept that was developed in the battlefield, uh, and we use it in modern medicine still. So every time someone arrives at an emergency department, they first meet a nurse, a triage nurse, and that nurse has the responsibility of quickly interviewing that patient and in three to five minutes deciding, is this person gonna get taken care of right away or should they wait? They're trying to assess a few things. They're saying, is this, uh, how high risk is this person for an adverse outcome? Should they be prioritized over another person that's already been waiting, right? Should they jump the line? Do they need our only open bed? Many times there's not even an open bed. We're gonna have to create it. Are they sick enough that I need to create a new open bed? Uh, and then if they're not sick, is this a person that needs a bed at all? Could I care for this person in a different area, maybe like an urgent care or fast track area of an ED? They have to do this really fast. How do they do this? Well, in 80 to 90% of emergency departments in the United States, they use this tool. It's called the Emergency Severity Index. Uh, as you can see, it's a very subjective, very simple tool. It was created in 1999, and over 20 years ago, it was innovative, right? Uh, things have changed drastically uh, since then, and we'll talk about some of the challenge with, challenges with it. Uh, but we'll go through this algorithm in just a moment with some scenarios, okay? Uh, a big challenge with the tool is that the tool is very subjective and it's resource driven. So we're making decisions based on what a nurse thinks about the patient in front of them with very limited data uh, in terms of their, their clinical severity, and then how many resources they think this patient's going to use in the emergency department. Uh, because of this subjectivity, variability is really high. Our group, our research group at Hopkins and many others have done studies showing that uh, the likelihood of, a patient, of two nurses agreeing about the triage level of a patient is about the same as me flipping a coin. It's actually 60%, a little bit better, but essentially the same. Uh, almost half the time nurses disagree. So it follows that mistriage is really common. There are a lot of studies on this, but the most alarming one came out this year uh, in JAMA Open Network from the Kaiser system. More than five million patients were triaged. Uh, and when they looked at that, that study, this was using the emergency severity index, Patients who required an immediate life-saving intervention during their ED stay, we're talking about intubation and mechanical ventilation, vasopressors, cardioversion, CPR, a third of those patients were triaged to level three or below, which means that they weren't recognized as high acuity and they were sent to the waiting room to wait. So imagine you're one of those patients pulled out of the waiting room with those sort of interventions needed, all right? And any time we have a system that has subjectivity, unfortunately, it's almost a guarantee that that system's gonna be full of bias, right? And full of inequity, and triage is no exception. There's a ton of data showing that the, uh, the unequal outcomes uh, that happen in the healthcare system begin at the very first decision that's made, triage. So uh, we're talking about it in the abstract now. Let's let, like, try to get to uh, some real examples. I think we have some people in the audience who may be here for care. You're welcome, I heard you were having some trouble. What's going on? <laughs> I'm a little lightheaded, okay. and uh, I have a little bit of chest pain. Okay, all right. How long has it been going on? Um, last couple of hours. Okay, all right. Can somebody give me uh, some vital signs for, for your welcome? Yes, Dr. I have those right here. Okay. Uh, systolic BP is 182. Uh, heart rate 110, oxygen at 98 looks like, respiratory rate at 22, and temp is a nice comfortable 98.4. Okay, Th those vital signs are, thank you very much, those, those vital signs are not normal, but I'm an emergency physician and those vital signs are not alarming. They're not way outside of normal, okay? So let me put you through this algorithm, uh, Joachim. Hang on just a second. These are the data that I would actually have as a nurse, okay? You don't look like you're dying right now. I don't know. I think you could probably wait without dying for 15 minutes. Um, how many resources are you gonna use? I'm definitely gonna get an EKG in you, I'm definitely gonna get a troponin, I'm definitely gonna get a chest X-ray. So you're a level three. As I said, I don't have any beds available, so I'm gonna have you sit down uh, because you're a level three patient, sorry. We'll get to you when we get a bed, all right? We got another patient here, Damaris. Yep, hi, I am 42. I am experiencing a little tightness, a little pressure in my chest. A little hard time breathing and a lot of anxiety about it. Okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm glad you're here for care. Okay, can we get some vital signs uh, for we, Damaris? We sure can. So here we have systolic BP of 109, heart rate 110, 
Uh, oxygen at 96, respiratory rate at 16, and temp again 98.4. Okay, well, let me put you through this algorithm. Oh, you're a three as well, right? <laughs> Uh, so you come out. I'm definitely going to be using similar resources to what I was going to use for your argument. If you could sit down, we'll get to you as soon as we have a bed available. It's going to be several hours, so get comfortable. All right, we have one more patient. What's bringing you here today? Okay. Ever had this before? No, no. Okay. All right. Can we get some vital signs? We sure can. One second, Dr. Hinson. We need them fast. We got, we got a lot going on in this ED. Uh, all right, this time we have systolic BP of 109, heart rate of 84, oxygen is at 96, respiratory rate at 16, and temp once again, 98.4. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Actually, congratulations. Those are all normal vital signs, so feeling pretty good. Let me put you through this algorithm. I'm going to end up on three again. Look at that, okay? So uh, you can have a seat. We'll be with you, not shortly. It's going to be a little bit of time, all right? Uh, so what happens when you have an algorithm like this? And again, this is the algorithm, and this is the process that is being used across our country, right? There are two reasons why we triage to the middle. One, because we use resources in all of our patients now. There is not a patient that comes to the ED and gets discharged you know, without using resources. So level five is never, ever used. Um, level four is very rarely used. Uh, and because um, we are nervous about being at the extremes and it's a subjective scale, we triage toward the middle. So if you uh, had a purple piece of paper, can you stand up? So see how this plays out? Yeah. So all of you guys are now having to fight for uh, maybe one to two beds that we're functionally using. All the rest of our beds are full, right? And someone has to get accepted upstairs for you to be able to be seen for the heart attack that you want to rule out, for the surgery that you're concerned that you're going to have, for the cancer diagnosis that you're concerned that you're going to have, right? It's a terrible situation. You can, you can sit back down. Thank you. Right? So, so we're in a bad spot. Uh, and it's nobody's fault, not an individual's fault. It's just a system that we have, and it's, it's what we've been using for more than two decades. So this is where we introduce Triage Go, okay? This idea that... Uh, Scott uh, came up with in 2015, probably before that. Uh, and what Triage Go is, it's a new tool that supports this same decision, uses the same inputs. When a patient arrives, we get the same vital signs, the arrival mode, the age, the chief complaint. Right? And then we compare that to the patterns that we've seen in past encounters. And a machine learning algorithm uses those predictor variables to estimate risk for three outcomes. Is this patient going to have a critical outcome, meaning are they going to an ICU or are they going to die? Are they going to have an emergency surgery or an emergency procedure? Are they going to get admitted to the hospital? Okay, and then it translates those probabilities for every single patient to a recommended triage level. So the algorithm has been trained in more than 2 million patients, and every time we go to a new hospital with this tool, it's optimized to the local population because there's differences. We could talk more about that uh, later if we want. Uh, so we're transitioning from resources to risk which is really important because we don't really care as physicians about resources. We care about the risk of the patient. And we're transitioning from subjective assessment to objective assessment. And we support the triage uh, provider, the nurse, by giving them information. So let's re-triage Joachim, okay? So I have the same data here. These are the same vital signs. Uh, a nurse puts them in the exact same way they did before, the same computer screen. They don't perceive any difference. When they advance to the next screen, those data, along with one additional element, past medical history, that we scrape from the medical record and don't request any additional inputs. They go into a cloud. Those data are processed through these machine learning algorithms. They're translated to prob risk probabilities, and that is then uh, translated back to a recommended triage level. And in the electronic health record, when they advance the screen in the one to two seconds it takes for the new screen to load, they get a recommended triage level, and they also get, you can't see it probably because it's, it's small and far away from you, but a, a uh, generative AI phrase. We're basically looking inside the algorithm and determining why the prediction was made, what the drivers are. This is explainable AI telling them why we're making a certain recommendation. And so when we look at Joachim's case, uh, we have his vital signs there. They're abnormal. The actual pattern of those abnormalities, even though they're mild, is not reassuring. 
Uh, so the interaction between the data is important. And then we also see that he has a, a past medical history of uh, hypertension, hyperlipidemia, and a prior diagnosis of aortic aneurysm. His risk for having a critical care outcome, going to an ICU, and for going to the OR is quite high, and so we recommend a level two. If we go to Damaris, vital signs are pretty good, but she's a little bit tachycardic, heart rate's a little high, doesn't have medical history. I do see that she's gonna have some increased risk of getting admitted to the hospital, and so we recommend that she be a level three. She's gonna have to wait. Uh, so we, we put her in level three bucket, okay? And then we go to uh, Kristen. So Kristen has no medical history. She's also, they all have chest pain, right? Her vital signs are totally normal. But her risk of being admitted, even though she's presenting with chest pain, even though she's gonna use resources, is, pre is very low. And she goes to a level four. So you can see that we've moved from a place where these folks were all the same under our old rubric. But now we have distributed these patients, these three patients, but at a you know, ED population level, we're really distributing people across different uh, levels and care streams. So our ones and twos, because we're using objective risk stratification, we're getting the people who are really sick. They're really at risk of going to an ICU, dying. We get those people into a bed fast. We, identi we, uh, we identify the critical illness, and then we call who we need to help us with that. Right? The level three patients, they're still going to wait, but you're going to see that, that they're not going to wait as long because there's not as many of them. And we're diverting a bunch of people down the level four and five pathway, and we're taking care of them in a different part of the emergency department, via uh, different streams. So fast tracks or, or uh, uh, what we call rapid care, lots of different protocols for that, okay? And we're doing it very safely. So on an individual level, what happens to Joachim? Well, he was placed in the last ED bed available because he was a level two and it's mandated that he has to be seen in 15 minutes. Uh, he got an EKG, he got labs. When a physician actually met him and heard his whole story, he was kind of playing it down over here, right? He's been having terrible back pain going through to his back. They looked, and so I, he got a CT angiogram. He's diagnosed with an aortic dissection, and he went level one to the OR with CT surgery. His life is saved. Good story, right? That could have been very bad if he's in the waiting room, and he would be in the waiting room under the other system. So for Damaris, she had to wait, just like she did before. However, uh, she was finally seen at two and a half hours. Diagnostics were initiated in the waiting room, uh, and uh, she got treatment and hospitalization initiated 30 minutes earlier than she would have under the old system. And what about Kristen, level four? She got all the diagnostics. She got a, uh, a EKG, labs, chest x-ray. All of her results were normal. Uh, her symptoms resolved with some Maalox. We ended up discharging her home and she follows up with a primary care doctor, right? She gets all this done in three hours because she's going through a different care stream, right? And so even though um, you know, we're, we're diagnosing severe disease uh, in people, uh, we're getting them to the, to the care that they need. Damaris ended up having a, a blood clot. She's getting admitted, all right, but we identified her faster than we would have under uh, prior systems. So these stories play out at the aggregate level. So these are data from uh, at least six hospitals that we are in currently. Uh, and we look at how things change before and after we put this tool into place. And what we see is that for all patients, we can accelerate the door, like arrival, to the decision to admit a patient uh, by just over half an hour. All right? We do that by enabling faster flow and driving people down the right care streams. We can accelerate the door to departure time. That's a very big deal, like real movement in the hospital for patients who are going to critical care or to an OR by an hour. I could talk more about how we do that, but that's because we, we increase the signal to noise ratio of critically ill patients. Uh, and then uh, we gain around, for an average ED, 8,500 hours, bed hours annually, and allow more processing of patients through the same limited beds. And one thing that we're working on right now, and we, we have shown and we'll be coming out with more about this, is that that bias and inequity that, that we've talked about, we can address a lot of that with, with our tools both by investigating it and countering it with objective data. When you take the subjectivity out of a system, you naturally reduce the amount of bias and inequity that, that exists within the system. So what's the opportunity for the future? So I told you about three cases. In an ED in a day, maybe 200 uh, patients can be affected by this. In a given ED in a, in a year, 60,000, and 140 million across our country in a year. Triage is the very first decision. It's not where we're stopping. We have a lot of other things going on. 
We're, we're in a span of six to eight hours in the emergency department for all of these patients. We're making decisions about triage. We're making uh, screening and targeted diagnostic decisions. We're making treatment decisions. And then we're making really important uh, disposition decisions for all of these patients. And so we've been really excited to transition from Hopkins to uh, Beckman Coulter and to team up with a group from industry who was really, like it was just, uh, the synergy w was obvious, right? They want to address the same things. And so Beckman Coulter has made a huge investment in emergency care in particular and in the development of AI-empowered clinical decision support to help us with all of those decisions that I just talked about. So I hope that, you know, we're very proud of Triage Go, but I hope it's like the very beginning of our success stories uh, and look forward to chatting with anybody about it. So thank you. <laughs>